So, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming to this uh, event today. Um, a lecture by Professor Reinhard Heinisch on conspiracies and populism, an empirical journey into the world of certain voters. Um, and it's uh, the second one now uh, in a row on populism uh, as part of our um, lecture series on uh, peaceful change. Uh, sponsored by the Austrian Research Association. Um, Reinhard, I should uh, mention, is, uh, is part of that, of that research group, has always been very, very supportive. Thanks a lot for that, by the way. And, um, uh, and last, last week we heard something about EU and, and, uh, and, and, and populism. Uh, today it probably is a little more on the comparative politics side, I would think. And um, when one looks at Reinhardt's work, then uh, the work on populism really comes quite logically, actually, out of what he's done beforehand. Uh, so he has a long and established track record uh, working on democracies. And, um, and populism obviously has something to do with uh, democracy, perhaps uh, not just uh, going the, the right way somewhere. Um, I want to introduce you uh, very quickly uh, to him. He's a very accomplished uh, scholar, public intellec intellectual actually as well. Uh, he has been, I've checked this now, for 13 years the chair of the political science department uh, at the University of Salzburg. Uh, congratulations that you have survived all of that. Because <laughs> uh, these jobs, they usually mean uh, a lot of administrative duties. Um, he came, as you'll hear when, when he speaks, uh, he comes uh, from the United States, where, where he studied, where he worked, and he still has an affiliation with the University of Pittsburgh, where he, where he, where he uh, worked before coming to Salzburg. He also has an affiliation as a visiting professor with the Renmin University in Beijing, uh, which, by the way, is a university where we, as a diplomatic academy, soon will have an exchange program with. <coughs> Um, he's published very widely. Um, to many of you, he's probably also known um, from watching television, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, news, not only uh, in Austria, uh, but also in the UK, also in the US, and so on. So uh, without any further ado, uh, please join me and welcome Professor Reinisch. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for, for attending and thank you, Marcus, for the invitation to, the working, to speak to the working group on, on peaceful change. So my, my talk is titled Sentiment, Conspiracy and Populism and it's sort of an empirical journey and it's going to be a little bit political science-y, so I apologize. Um, but I'll, I'll stick to 35 minutes. So there's plenty of room for, for uh, question and answers. And essentially, as I said, my name is Reinhard Heinisch. I'm a professor of comparative Austrian politics at the, at the University of Salzburg. Previously, my academic work and career was in the US. And if you're interested in my work, um, I, there's my, my website, there's my publications, and also um, the projects that I've been doing. And I want to give you an overview of um, my research I've been doing, on, particularly on the connection between populism sentiment, emotion, conspiracy, and how that translates into political decision-making. The, um, the, 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 the data that I'm sharing with you are from two main projects, um, from a, a EU-funded uh, European Union Horizon project that we terminated, that we finished last year, and a new project that's funded by the Austrian Research uh, Foundation, the Swiss National Science Foundation on Populist Conspiracy. Sort of the, the we developed the surveys and the survey experiments, um, but they carried out sort of the, the sample, the, the sampling and the, the implementation of the surveys is done by um, a, a research uh, survey firm in Linz, the Market Institute in, in Linz. Um, so I, I'd like to talk briefly about populism and who the populists are, then talk about emotions and lack of control and how that relates to political decision making populism and authoritarianism and what it, what it means in terms of people feeling sick, for example, just to show you that even physiological, physiological states ha may have political causes. And then finally, a close with a brief overview of, of um, our work on, con on conspiracy beliefs. So 
I guess uh, all of you know, if you look at social media at any time, you see there, is, um, there, there are a lot of outrageous claims that are being made, and these claims are being believed, even by people who, and it's kind of fascinating, because we would say when people seem to war live normal lives, and then they seem to believe certain completely outlandish ideas. And you wonder how these two things go together. How do they get through life normally if they don't have the belief that is completely contrary to what your own experience, your, your sensory input would actually tell you. And we recently in Vienna, some of you may have seen this, there's a big demonstration, there the were routinely demonstrations where there are people who are disaffected um, with the political system, they're quite, um, they're quite um, irritated, they're alienated from established politics, and they're peddling all sorts of um, um, outlandish ideas, for example, that baby parts are being tr traded on the black market and, and, and sort of supporting the Russian invasion, believing climate is a hoax, QAnon, immigration, the great replacement, sort of all sorts of ideas that seem to sort of be way out there, and people seem to be really clinging to these ideas. And the question is, what, does, what happens if you have a significant portion of your population that believes in those kinds of ideas? Now, let's look at this in a little bit more systematic fashion, and let's look at, just in the Eurozone, uh, in terms of the support for uh, radical populist parties. And I include parties of the radical right and the radical left here. And you can see that the share of these parties has been consistently going up. It's not linear, there are ups and downs, but overall, well, we were around 6% in, in 2011, we were around 25% um, around prior to COVID, and it's increased ever since. And just to make the connection, and that's something we can talk about in the Q&A, it, it makes a difference for political decision making and for international relations if a quarter to a third of your public you know, believes in something, has a belief system that is quite contrary to what, what we normally think of conventional mainstream politics. Um, so let me perhaps talk about the terminology populism, how we think about it in, in populism research. And one of the challenges that populism has been defined in many different ways, and, and, in some, and it can be quite confusing. So populism can be a political style. Um, populism can also be a mobilization strategy. And as a political style or as a strategy, it has been with us since the dawn of democracy. In other words, these are people who seek to connect to certain voters by, um, by embracing a certain language. They want to simplify things, or they want to make outrageous claims, they want to punch through, or they want to show signal by through their actions, through their imagery, or through their speech, that they are in touch with the common people. Those things may be problematic, those things is usually what we read about in the newspapers, but that is not what we think is a threat to liberal democracy. That is something completely different. That is a legitimate subject for research, but it's not what we're studying, those of us who are interested in the impact of populism on, on liberal democracy. When we think about populism, we think of populism as a belief system, or as a set of ideas, or as a, as a thin ideology, and if you think it's, it's too thin to be an ideology, it's not, it doesn't cohere enough, at least it's a set of ideas, and these ideas animate both political actors and it animates certain voters and certain people. So, so in other words, populism as, a, as an ideology, in, so what are some of the core ideas that, that define populism? Populists invariably are all animated by the idea there's an inherent antagonism between two homogenous groups. One group are the good people, and the other group are the corrupt, nefarious elites, the dangerous others, the outsiders. And these are not empirical groups, so the good people are not the citizens necessarily. These are, in, in the American context, is always the heartland. And you know, the question then is, okay, where's the first town of the heartland? You're starting in New York City and drive west, where's the heartland start? or the real Austrians, the real Corinthians, the real Slovaks, the real Czechs. Who are the real and the unreal? So whenever we are in this territory of an ambivalent group that excludes some and includes others, but they're not really empirically real, we enter populist territory. And then on the other side are the corrupt elites, and they are also ambivalent. They can be the political class, the deep state, um, the, the, lane, the mainstream politician, the old parties. 
Uh, and there's a, the, 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 the scientists, the doctors, the medical professionals, the bankers, I, I, the lamestream media, et cetera, et cetera. So you see these are these ambivalent categories, and I like this one poster from Slovakia, that sort of, uh, because a third category is, is a third uh, a characteristic is a binary worldview, a Manichaean worldview, where you have, there's no compromise between light and dark, between the people and the elites. And you see this on this poster where you see sort of um, the European Union, Soros, and gay lovers on the bad side, and you see on the other side, the light and, 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 and all the, the wonderful things. And in each society, and, and populists have national narratives that convey that kind of, that kind of uh, idea. And like all belief systems, populism also tells you what is wrong, <clears throat> who is to blame, and what is to be done. And what you can do now in, in, as a researcher, if you work on parties, you can now look at speeches, you can look at manifestos, at party programs, and can, you can identify through coding, through text analysis, in the speeches and in the uh, programs, those kinds of ideas. And you can then determine whether or not a, part, a political party, a political actor is populist, isn't populist, and to what extent they meet, they fit that criteria. But, for this purpose and this discussion and for uh, research uh, of late, I'm more interested in the people. Who are the people that believe those kinds of things? What is the, demogra what is the profile of the populist sympathizer? So we get a sense of who are these people empirically. <clears throat> One of the problems we've had for a long time was simply we just didn't have good data, there were no data. So often, and there's a joke that a lot of studies on populism have been written in the Netherlands. So much what we know about populism for a long time was simply based on Dutch, on, 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 on the Netherlands. And somehow, we always assume, well, the Netherlands must be the prototypical country and we explain the world through the Netherlands. So we had a lot of case studies, and in some cases we had good data, but they were nationally contained. Um, and or for the more global studies, um, often we had to use proxy measures. For example, um, some of you may have heard of um, a book the, 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 uh, called The Backlash by, by Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart. Um, and, but their book was based on a, a proxy measure of populism, trust in government. So often we didn't have good ways to measure it. And then a few years ago, um, a, a, um, the comparative studies of the electoral system CSES came out in, in that last iteration of this survey that is given every few years across Europe in 20-some democracies. Um, they had a battery of indicators that really tested these populist attitudes. And so some of that's why the research is rather recent, because up to very recently, we didn't really have good data. The other problem we had, we didn't have a good way of identifying political parties as populist. So, but also now there is a, a data set available that out of 200 some parties, um, country experts were definitely able to identify the parties um, that uh, we would consider populist that fit the, 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 the definition, the pattern. So now that makes it possible for us to relate, okay, now who are the people and what are the characteristics that seem to uh, opt for these parties. So anyway, so these are um, 15 countries um, and the following re the findings that I show you are applying to these uh, European countries because in all these cases, the questions were comparable. There were more countries in the data set, but there were always issues with some of the, the questions. So, and, and so these, it's voters in these 15 countries selecting or opting for 34 out of 205 parties, and these 34 parties are, are these radical populist parties, and we want to understand who are these people who voted for that. And it's like, imagine baking a cake. You need different ingredients. It's sort of what we do is we, 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 we bake our cake as a, as a model, and we're adding now different factors to the model and see which of the factors check out, which factors contribute um, contribute to m making people more likely to support a radical populist party. Let's start with the demographic profile. You know, democracy, age, demography, age, gender, education, income, employment status, and religiosity. So let's add that to the mix and see, does that make people um, 
become, uh, make people more likely to vote for populist parties. And, and in, if we build the logistical regression models, and if you're not in statistics, just ignore the numbers, bear with me, focus on the text. Um, but, um, what, what, but the findings indicate that indeed, if we add these variables, the, um, the, the voters, those voters who vote for these parties are more likely to be male, more likely to be lower to middle income, they're not university, uh, sorry, lower to middle education, they're not university educated, they tend to have lower income, um, they tend to be active in the labor force, so they're not retired, they're not uh, unemployed, and they're also not religious. And all these factors relate significantly, increase significantly the probability to vote for a radical populist party. Then let's look at some of the attitudes. How do they, what is their view on democracy? What is their um, ideological attitude? And we could ask, are these voters close or distant to traditional parties? Are they more on the left? Are they more on the right? Are they satisfied or dissatisfied with democracy? Do they like a strong leader or do they not like a strong leader? And if we, again, look at the model, we put that into the model, we find there and these are voters who don't have a close connection to an established party. They are ideologically more to the right. They do want a strong leader and they are highly dissatisfied with democracy. Um, now, this may not be a great surprise, it would have thought so, but you need to show it in the data. It's just not enough if we assume it, but you also need to, one needs to actually show it. But again, you see the sample size, you know, in the model we have this 15,000, uh, sample size 15,000 here, in the full, in the, in the, in the, the, the overall sample was 18,000. So then, next we want to know, okay, what policy attitudes do they have? What do they want government to do? And what we find very interesting here is, so the, they are socioculturally on the right, but they favor leftist social policies. So they are not your traditional, traditional radical right that wants right social policy, small government, but actually they favor big government protectionist socioeconomic policies, but socioculturally, they're on the right. And of course, they're very strongly anti-immigration. I guess we're not, they're not, it's not very surprising. And lastly, we wanted to add our populism, um, our, our populism ideas, and if we add those into the mix, and we find indeed that the people who are uh, more likely to vote for radical populist party strongly hold the attitude, they're strongly anti-elitist, they are people-centered, and they subscribe to a Manichaean binary worldview. So in fact, all this as a group together defines the group, the universe of, of populist voters across at least these um, 15 Western European democracies uh, based on the most recent and most relevant data that we can find. So that allows us at least to, to sort of understand a bit of the, of the group. Let's now move on and think about the role of emotions and fears. And we can sort of imagine the following. Imagine um, we're, living in, we're living in a world where there are a lot of massive processes occurring at the meta level. There is insecurity, there's globalization, there are wars, there are, there's integration, economic integration. So there are a lot of processes going on at a very, very high level that percolates down to the individual level. So the assumption is individuals may feel they are a small part in a world that they can control. Things are happening to them. So the idea is there's a feeling that they lack control. Well, so the argument is people have a diffuse sense of ontological insecurity, sort of uh, an, an insecurity of being, from certain, from, from uncertain um, social and economic conditions at the macro level. In other words, people feel powerless to influence what goes on around them. Goes, they feel powerless to influence what, what uh, affects them. And in response, they radicalize and they opt for parties that promise them radical change. They promise to restore an environment, a community where you feel safe, where there's order and where everything is familiar, sort of make America great again. And um, 
Well, the, if that's the hypothesis, we can, we can do an analysis on this. We can say, okay, um, there was uh, the European Values um, Study of 2017 included questions where people were asked whether they feel they have control over their lives. And in that same survey, people are also asked, what party appeals to you? What party is close to you? Well, what we can now do is essentially, we can simply group the parties based on the percentages, the shares of people who supported the party and who said, I've lost control over my lives. So if, you, if we, each bar represents the share of people voting for a party, and this is the share of people saying, I have no control. And then if we, if we group the parties, we see that the taller bars are over on your left, and the, the, the bars, the shorter bars, where people have fewer control problems, are over to the right. And the black bars indicate populist parties, and the gray bars indicate normal or mainstream parties. And you think just by visually by eyeballing, we see that the parties where people say, that the, the bars where a lot of people are saying, I have control problems in my life, are over on the, on the left. And these are most of the populist party. And the further we move to the right, the smaller the number of people saying they have control anxiety, and the more we, we are in the territory of mainstream parties. Now, this is sort of a visual representation. We can, of course, also um, uh, do a model statistically, and we, have a, we can use a regression model again. And here you see we're predicting whether the parties that are listed across the top, whether these parties have an appeal to the voters. The, the likelihood of these party being appealing, we have the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, a German populist party, the link here, leftist populist party, UKIP in the UK, the Scottish National Party, the Finns party, the Austrian Freedom Party, and we could continue this. And first, we, we use our standard explanations, male, age, education, income. These are all typical ex, ex, uh, explanatory factors for why people vote for populist parties. And now let's add loss of control. And we add loss of control, we find that loss of control is indeed um, connected in many cases to making radical populist parties, both of the left and the right, more appealing. It increases the appeal. And the appeal remains strong or remains present even if we add other control variables such as immigration attitudes, income, and uh, left-right left, left attitudes, for example. Now, this is just makes the argument if you experience a sense of loss of control, are you going to vote for a party that promises you to restore control? That's one argument. But how about the following argument? What if control issues make, harden your other views, make you much more determined make in, in, in other areas? What if loss of control, for example, that fear interacts with other attitudes? Let's, for example, look at anti-immigration. We know that anti-immigration is a big predictor of voting for radical right parties. Does loss of control in combination with anti-immigration make you even more likely to vote for a radical populist party? Well, we can test this. What we can, what we can do here, we can split our sample and we can split our sample into a pro-immigration group and an anti-immigration group. And then we just look at our pro-immigration group. And what you have here is on the, in this plot, we, on, on, on the side you have the probability to vote for the German AFD, the Alternative of Deutschland. Is the probability 0%, 20%, 40%, 60%. And the two dots that are connected by a line, the dots represent the mean of the group. And there is, so if, sorry, if, if we look at um, the bottom left corner, this, these are the people who say we have no control problem and we're pro-immigration. And how likely are these people to vote for the AFD? 
very unlikely. It's about 0%. It's very, very low likelihood. Loss of control doesn't do anything there. Let's look at the second group. These are the people who are pro-immigration and they have control problems. But do they, are they going to vote for the AFD? No. It's the likelihood is very low. So immigration is a much more important predictor and, 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 and loss of control doesn't do anything here. But let's look at the other group. Let's look at the anti-immigration people. And there it looks quite different. If we see the first, if we look to that group over on the left, we see these are the people who have no control problems and they hate immigrants and therefore they vote for the AFD at a slightly under 20%. But now we add the anti-immigration folks plus loss of control and you see how much the propensity to vote for a radical right parties jumps up. It jumps from under 20% to almost 40%. So you see a strengthening effect. And so very often what is the complexity when it comes to emotions is it hardens existing political attitudes and reframes existing political attitudes in certain ways. And that then has effects that we sense also in voting. And that can happen often very, very quickly. We can run this for the whole sample for all countries uh, together and what you can see here there are two lines a perforated line and a solid line and you can see as you move from and from from um, pro-immigration to anti-immigration the people who have a lot who have a lot of control problems are significantly more likely the perforated line is much higher as about 30 percent um, in, um, in that um, in, in, in increasing the propensity to vote for, for radical right populist parties across the entire spectrum. So it's not just the AFD, but it's across all the radical parties that we've, we've looked at. Let's change subject. Let's in, entertain the question, and I'm curious what you think in the Q&A. So the, the, the basic premise of this is, do you, imagine you're sick. Does having um, political attitudes make you feel more sick or not? It seems a strange question because you would assume if you're sick, being sick is a physiological state. You have headache, you have a temperature. It shouldn't matter whether you vote for party X or party Y, how high your temperature is. So, but is there a connection between attitudes and the experience of sickness? You could extend this, some other seemingly objective factor. Let's say, um, have you been hard hit by, have you been hit by economic hard times? Again, you would imagine my income, my bank account, whether I have a job, I don't have a job, these are objective factors, they should determine how I feel about my economic fortune. It shouldn't depend on my political attitudes. So what we did was, um, in the Austria went through the first uh, corona wave um, in 2020. It managed to get through that wave pretty quickly. Austria, uh, there was a lockdown, but in the end, the government received a lot of plaudits for having handled this really well. The incidence rates was rather low, and then it was a great summer, and this was all before the, the demonstrations and the other things that happened, the, the vaccination issues and so on. So we assumed, we did a survey experiment, and we assumed, well, we're gonna probably get people gonna say, well, you know, economically it wasn't so hot, I was locked away at home, some people may have lost their job, but health-wise, there's gonna be fine. And we got pretty much this finding. If we look at this finding, and the gray bars are people, you know, we ask people from zero to 10, how much have you been affected in your health? And we also ask people, how much have you been affected in your economic well-being? And we found that, um, as predicted, the largest bar are people saying we were not affected. But it's about 25%. But that means 75% of the people were somehow affected. Which is surprising, because even if you factor in undercounting, et cetera, the number of people that are reported having been sick were not anywhere near um, you know, 75% or 70% or, or, or of, of 9 million people. So that was a very surprising finding. And then we did a lot of analysis, a lot of, we looked at a lot of who these people were, we looked at voters and different voter groups, but I'll spare you the detail. We then tried to understand, okay, what made the people feel sick? What was it that, what is the biggest driver of that? And we again built a, a model, 
And, um, and the first model, the, the coefficient plot, is simply gives you the, uh, the effects of which of the factors, the variables, were actually driving that. And the way you read this model, you see that vertical, um, you see that the vertical perforated line, that's the no effects line. Anything that touches that line has no effect. And the horizontal lines, you see the, the, the little dots or the, the little squares, these are the means, and the little lines around it are the confidence interval. If, any, if the stuff is four to the right of you, then it has a positive effect, a significant one, and if it's to the left, it has a negative effect. And we see, for example, that attitudes about government have no effect. Demographic variables also have no effect. Income has some effect, but but not very high, and the income, for example, the higher the income, the less you felt sick. Makes sense. Wealthier people had bigger homes, were more able to protect themselves, so it's the way you would imagine it to be. But we were surprised that populist attitude, we included in the survey the same populist uh, attitude uh, battery of questions. In every configuration, we calculated this in three different times, populism um, had a significant effect predicted whether you said, um, I was really affected and felt sick as a result of COVID. We also had a question in there that uh, it was an indicator of authoritarian attitudes. And um, we also had a question of whether people felt they could cope with their income. So not the objective income, but the feeling about their income, whether it could make ends meet. And very similarly also on it being economically affected. Here populism was only significant in one, um, in one of the configurations, but authoritarian attitudes and, 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 um, and in coping with income was, had an effect and, and it, it, it actually had a measurable impact on how people felt. And the irony is that we were able to detect this already before a lot of the, 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 the political problems in the fall. We could already see the emotional potential that was there. So, and again, the connection between these very subjective um, attitudes and seemingly objective physical and economic states is a very interesting uh, finding for us. And these papers have been published, by the way. Um, so, and, and lastly, I want to get uh, a few, say a few things about conspiracy theories, and that is sort of the, the, our current work. So, first, we need to define what conspiracy theories are. So, a, a conspiracy theories, by definition, uh, a conspiracy theory communicates an idea that things just don't happen by chance, uh, and the world is divided into two spheres: good and evil, and that there is a secret plan that is implemented, that is unobserved. And often conspiracy theories mimic essentially scientific reasoning by cherry picking evidence, by pointing to certain facts that they throw in your face, and well that proves conclusively that this is really going on. And conspiracy theories single out certain groups, the guilty groups. Conspiracies can come from above, from below, from inside, and from outside. So, I don't think that I, I, this is a stretch, but I guess you can see the connection, the affinity to populism. Because there's a lot of things that populism and conspiracy theories have in common, and therefore populist uh, policymakers, populist political actors engage and use uh, conspiracy theories because they can readily appeal to their core voters. And by the same token, um, people who have um, believe in populists, have a, a populist worldview, and believe in a, in a certain way the world works, tend to have a great affinity, a great susceptibility to uh, conspiracy theories. And it, it's, it's very fertile. So there's a, a connection. And that is why we see with the increase in, in populism also an increase in the use and, uh, and, and abuse, if you will, of, of conspiracy theories. Now, conspiracy theories have a number of components. I don't think this is very, this is quite clear. The secrecy, there's the famous proof, there's a dualism in good and bad, or scapegoats. There are the, the, the truth uh, seers or truth sayers. And um, there's the demonization, and, and there are the patterns, the evil intentions, the secret plot, um, that, that is all part of that. Um, what's the difference between conspiracy theories and ideologies? 
The difference is an ideology is a simply an explanation of how the world works. And the ideology, an ideology, a set of beliefs is just there. Conspiracy theories are inherently dynamic. There is a dramaturgical structure, there's a process to them. They keep moving. So the conspiracy theories on Monday moves on to Tuesday, to Wednesday, to Thursday, to Friday. There's always news that is like a movie that's unfolding. So first there is the chosen few who see farther than anyone else and understand what's going on, to figure out what's going on. Then they point to the pattern. Then the pattern gives way to the secret plan. Then they, um, they will identify the group that's going to harm us. Then they will s tell you how everything is tying together and how everything is connected to the conspiracy. And finally, they warn you of the impending doom collapse and, and the urgence and call for urgent action. So there is an inherent, um, there, there's a, a dramatic uh, dimension to it. Now, this is not research that we've done yet, but the colleagues with, with whom we work in, 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 in Germany, um, sort of if, you, if you connect conspiracy theories, again, in, in sort of experiments, with other, their attitudes, with other existing attitudes, um, the, we find, interestingly, that um, conspiracy beliefs have a negative correlation with democracy. Sort of people who believe in conspiracy tend to tend to be skeptical of democracy, they tend to be skeptical of elections, um, but they tend to be, um, uh, it, but they tend to favor direct democracy, interestingly, technocracy, um, dictatorship, and political responsiveness. Some of this makes sense, some of this is uh, puzzling to us, but there is an interesting kind of expected uh, finding that liberal democracy institutional democracy is a problem for people who strongly believe in conspiracy theory. The, the institutional dimension is what, what, what scares people who seem to subscribe to this view. Um, almost a, at the end, uh, if we were to look at the causes of, of conspiracy theories that we're also testing, the, these are essentially four of the main explanations that the literature and, uh, has, has given so far. On one level, you can say um, conspiracy theories are a f a sort of a function of a crisis of identity. People um, um, feel life is full of contingencies, feel that life is sort of unfulfilled, and try to fulfill their lives by plugging the gaps with fantastic narratives, with, with fantasies in some ways, as an effort to explain uh, your role in a in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a greater in, in a greater um, um, development, if you will, and it also makes the the the, the, the truth seer the hero of the story. You then elevate your your role in in, in the scheme of things. A conspiracy theories can also be sort of an ersatz religion, a substitute religion. In a sense, when there's a, a major crisis like COVID and people have existential fears and they look for deeper meaning and they would in the past use, they would uh, turn to religion and in a more secular society, all they get is a five point plan by the government and that may not suffice to, to, uh, to do that. And therefore, people turn to uh, fantastic accounts, uh, to conspira conspiracy accounts in order to explain what, what is going on. A third explanation is um, we know from, from, from psychology that people strive for cognitive consistency and simplicity to make sense of it all. And at the same time, we live in an environment where, where processes are very complex and where people are offered a, a diffuse plethora of information out of which they can sort of cherry pick and choose. And they, um, in, in, in the effort to make it understandable, make sense of their existence, people tend to um, follow the um, simpler uh, patterns that, 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 that are comfortable ways of explaining away why certain things are happening to them. Conspiracy theories also can be a, a supply side phenomenon that political actors essentially um, 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 you know, can appeal to the, anxiety, the latent anxieties people have by providing them with scapegoats and explanations in order to mobilize and attract and attract voters. Last slide. Overall, the idea is, in all these cases, I think the research comes from the idea there are these big matter events at the global level 
which then result in disequilibria, systemic shocks, dynamic change, challenges uh, established order and authority, the, the impact is uneven, there are winners and, st and losers, there's a status that's being redistributed, the complexity means the individual can connect him or herself to what is going on and feels lost, and the established coping mechanisms are, are strained, and as a result we see the backlash, the polarization, the felt truths, and a pervasive desire for order and stability, and that is pretty much what has uh, motivated my research. I'm hoping you find this interesting, you had some questions. Thank you very much. Norena, thank you very, very much. I definitely learned a lot. Um, uh, it was a great talk, and, uh, and, and if, I just, if I would have to structure, there were probably four parts to it. Uh, one was about attitudes, from attitudes to populism. One was uh, from illness, from corona to populism. One was on conspiracy theories. And the last one was basically the, the big picture. Uh, so now feel free, feel free to ask whatever questions you may have. And as usual, I anticipate, and I see quite a few of you already, I anticipate quite a lot of them. So I'm going to bundle always questions, uh, always three at a time. Yes, please. And Anna Sophie, yeah. Hi, my name is Ala. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question would be um, Did you study whether the votes are linked to a particular figure, like Johnson, Orban, or to the party's agenda itself? Thank you. This, and then, and then the. Your two colleagues in the front, yeah. Good. Uh, my name's Evan. Uh, my is too soon at the DA. And my question pertains a little bit to how, I guess, misinformation and conspiracy theories can flow. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, conspiracy theories flow very effectively on social media. And I was wondering if there are steps that can be taken to, I guess, limit the flow of conspiracy theories on uh, social media sites without infringing on freedom of speech and, and things of this nature. So. Good evening. Um, I'm Peter. I'm my C student as well. Thank you, first of all, for your insightful presentation. I have actually two questions. Uh, one is uh, about the role of technology in the spread of, first and foremost, the disinformation, and what role do social media like Twitter, like Facebook, have on 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 polarization, on populism in general. I mean, we saw the example of 2016 elections in the US. And the second question would be, um, in your first slides you mentioned the variables which make the populist voter, and uh, in the column for religion there was no correlation, at least as far as I recall. And usually uh, in, in the case of Hungary, or I'm from Slovakia, so we're qu quite <coughs> religious uh, countries, and those populi major populist uh, political parties, they really emphasize the role of traditional values, of, of uh, wide Christian identity, like they want to protect it. Uh, so how is that, that it hasn't, uh, uh, why is it not a variable uh, at all, at least what has been uh, projected in your assessment? Thank you, and a very interesting question, Reinhardt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, they're all great questions. Um, first question about um, the, the, the leaders. Um, so there are certain limitations to, to this kind of work with data. When you study um, political leaders, it probably makes a lot of sense to, um, to do a survey in that particular country and then have a very nuanced way of trying to understand that. Um, for example, and then you can, what you can do is you can either then look at speeches and then um, I know a colleague of mine, Kirk Hawkins, um, did uh, Hugo Chavez, for example, and he looked at speeches and then he tried to, to see um, what, um, what 
uh, to what extent people were drawn uh, to these leaders, and you can you can you can do different studies by by having by asking people what they could re recall, and if people recall particular speech patterns or, or phrases by the leader, we can establish that there is a there's a connection. People people uh, do respond to a particular leader. In this kind of work, we were focused on on parties, and um, and but the question of Hungary is a good one because Hungary. Is doesn't fit the pattern, and Hungary is an interesting because it's really hard to think of Fidesz as. Uh, let me backtrack. We, we, with the way you run a logistic regression, you take the populist party and 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 calculate the likelihood of voting for the, for that party versus voting for the mainstream party. The problem is there's no mainstream party really in Hungary. Fidesz is sort of the Hungarian mainstream party. It is not the radical outsider party that just has come to power. It is the dominant party. So in other words, we don't really have um, a comparison case in Hungary. And if we run it, the, if we put Hungary into our normal model, the numbers come up strange. Because in Hungary, the mainstream party is the populist one. But um, so, uh, you know, it, uh, when you run a model, the, 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 the cases that are atypical, um, you, you find it difficult to make them work or detect it. So now Hungary is a very special case because of the power, the, the length of which Orban has been in power, the change in the constitution, and um, pretty much the, the pervasiveness of, of, of the system that he has. And therefore, you know, Hungary doesn't quite fit the pattern of a typical Western liberal democracy um, for which the, the, the survey was designed. It, but it doesn't mean that I would, and there's an ongoing debate in the literature whether Orban is a populist, and there are different labels. He's a, it's a authoritarian traditionalist and illiberal democrat. So there are lots of different um, definitions that even Hungary specialists. I would qualify him as a populist, but I'm not a Hungary expert. But that's sort of the, the best result I can give you. But Hungary is one of these interesting questions, and um, we need to actually uh, get a better understanding of uh, Poland, Hungary, um, Slovakia and the Czech Republic. I've worked on the Czech Republic. I have a Slovak student coming, PhD student in, in the spring where we will look looking in detail on at Slovakia. These are interesting cases, but um, there is an inherent Western bias in a lot of the data um, in the survey work, and I think we need to correct that over time. Um, the, the misinformation um, and, and the social media and what can be done about it. It's one of this... Um, I, I work with Sven Engasser at the TU Dresden, who is a well-known communication specialist, and some of my publications in our handbook on populism with another German um, communications person. We, we have this debate, and it's kind of funny. I'm not a communications person. We in political science don't think, okay, we, we, there's a lot of things we cannot explain. So we assume it must be communication, because communication is really, is really it. The communications folks say, no, 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 it's the political science part. They will say, oh, there's not a single study that shows the impact of communication more than 10%. So we go back and forth. My sense is, and we have a few surveys where we try to, where we actually do a survey experiment, where we have a fake Facebook message, and the fake Facebook message, um, where we then match the message with different parties and see how people react. We can, we can show that, but it was in Austria, in Germany, and I think in Bulgaria, where we can show that these messages played a key role in, in propagating and increasing um, um, populist attitudes. Um, <clears throat> However, it's, 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 a, it's complicated, um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. So that's, it's very complicated to actually test this. We know, for example, that Facebook is a much more important medium than Twitter. Twitter has, is a medium for journalists and for elites and intellectual, and has its own function. But to propagate it often, uh, we find that some of the more lowbrow social media are the more, are the more effective ones that, where you see a lot of uh, conspiracies. I just look at my own Facebook site, and, and, and there's some people, and I look at some of the conspiracy theories that are peddled there, I find it quite interesting. What can you do against it? Um, well, it's media literacy, media literacy, media literacy. It's training in, 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 in media training, in media understanding, in schools and in, in, uh, in to anywhere possible. We did um, a study of young Austrians, 26 
16 to 26, and those who had media training um, responded significantly, were much more effective in detecting um, fake messages than those who, who did not. Um, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer, but the media training and political training is, uh, political education is a very, very important uh, element in, in this. Anna, thanks a lot. I think then we can go uh, on. Sorry, I, there was one sorry, more. Sorry, there was. The uh, sorry, there was. Yeah, yeah. The so polarization <coughs> and religiosity. Very great question. Um, the, the radical right claims to defend defend Christendom, but they're not really religious. They make a sociocultural argument. They don't make a religious argument. So the people who vote for these parties are actually not religious, and you can ask how often you go to church. It's not the people who say we're the most often churchgoers, it's the people who, um, who actually don't go to church very often, but it's a sociocultural argument. And we did a study on the Austrian Freedom Party, and I interviewed Freedom Party officials, and I asked them, said, look, you make this argument about, did you go to church very often? I said, no, this is not about religion, it's about our culture. So it's a Christian, Judeo-Christian culture that we're defending. This is not about the re religiosity in the sense of Christian democratic. Party. The Abendland. <laughs> Abendland yes. <laughs> um, let's go. Let's go on with this side, perhaps. They, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jona. I'm also a student here at the DA, and my question relates to conspiracy theories. Uh, you pointed out that there, there's a, like this cycle and that they're constantly evolving. And I think that's something we see that different uh, conspiracy theories constantly like merge with uh, in each other and form new ones. And I also think, or I ask you whether you also observe this, that it's also an element that they constantly have to become more extreme in order to ma maintain their appeal. And an additional question to that is that with this process that they constantly need to be, like, become more extreme, more radical, that there is a somewhat self-regulating mechanism in that, that some people drop out and say, okay, I don't want to be associated with this any longer. Um, I saw a couple of interviews with like ex-QAnon believers in the US, and they said, okay, at some point it had gotten just so crazy and that I could not, no longer support it. Thank you. I think there was, yeah, there are two more. Uh, thank you. My name is Isabel. I'm also a MICE 2 student. And my question would relate to conspiracy, as well to conspiracies, especially concerning party members. And I'm thinking especially of the January 6th in the United States and of the specific example, for example, of Liz Cheney, who during her time uh, under the Trump administration had voted um, almost like completely in alignment with Trump, but very openly is now also on the Gen 6 commission and very openly has opposed um, Gen 6. And what this, what, how this affects also how party members maybe vote and how they, um, oh, like how they talk about their opinions um, in relation to conspiracy, conspiracy theories in parties, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay, my name is Bezai Lutka Bede. I'm from MICE 2 also. Uh, and my first question would be from the variables of loss of control. Uh, and when you stated, when you classified people with loss of control and without, uh, is it based on clinically prove, proven thing or um, also someone saying I have control, does that uh, rule out having control? Because mostly um, psych in psychology they have poor insights rather than um, stating what they actually are uh, feeling. Uh, and my second question would be, uh, why is populism always in the negative um, side? Like, what, is it always a bad thing to, to have a populist government or to have populist ideology because in uh, uh, South American and uh, like Bolivian, they had um, good good benefit or outcome from it. So, how do you see it? Thank you. Thank you. There was another three. Yeah. Uh, again, very <laughs> great questions. I mean, I think with the first question, I can, do you want to <laughs> hire you? Um, I, I can just say yes, yes, and yes. At least that's the, my understanding. And, and, and I think I would make the connection to a cult. Some of the literature, the most interesting literature that's come out of conspiracy theories is when you look at 
uh, literature on cults in the 1970s because cults have the same problem. Cults make these outlandish promises. They need to tell you a story. The day comes closer. Then you need to top it with some other event and need to top it with some other event. And then certain people drop out. You bring in new people that you have to make it attractive. You have adjusted. And what we don't understand at this point, um, when do people drop out? What is the mechanism that we can understand? I think we understand the emotional hook much better but we don't quite understand how to defang it. Um, because the, the interesting thing is, um, um, when you see people that believe, have these beliefs, like think of QAnon. I mean, think about the idea. There's, these are people who majorly make the case that um, re elites capture kids, abduct them, kill them, drink their blood, and have secret parties. And these people have this belief hold on to jobs, drive cabs, buses, talk, vote, have families. It, that seems, how does a person who believes that get through the day? That's just, a, a, it's just weird. I mean, just to, on a, on a, to think about this. I mean, how do they, how does this work? And, and, and then how do you get there and how do you come out? I mean, do they believe the whole thing, hook and, uh, hook and sinker? Or do you, believe in, do you believe in all sorts of conspiracies, like the moon landing is fake and Elvis is alive, and then you also believe political conspiracies, or these completely different things? Now, we don't really have good answers. It seems to be, what we, best we can tell, and people tend to have a general propensity to believe in these things, that tends to have some major event that has shaken their faith in, in reality as we see it, and then they somehow convince themselves to follow a trail of breadcrumbs to the gold treasure, which is the conspiracy, and to block out a counterfactual evidence. But how that works on an attitudinal and, and an emotional level is not quite clear. What we do is, you can't, you can't do surveys. We can't just ask people, do you believe? We have to use survey experiments in order to, to, to get at that in some ways. But we're also not psychologists. We need to understand, we try to understand the political implications. So we can only go so far into psychology. We can go into political psychology, but then we have to stay on the political science side and then have let our partners in psychology work on, on the psychological aspect. But I mean, it is exactly as you described. It, it, it is, feeds on itself, it helps perpetuates, and it needs to have a new narrative in order to, to stay alive. And we've seen this uh, in COVID. COVID is wonderful because first COVID makes you infertile, then uh, the women were infertile, but also then it, it, it affects men. But then that was, was obvious that wasn't the case I needed something else. So it was like there were constantly new ideas that were coming in to keep, the, to keep, this, uh, to keep this going. <clears throat> the question... On, on parties, and th that you've, you, um, you, you've hit on something that I find super interesting, and that is uh, also work we're currently doing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a major skeptic of traditional survey research because I think the fact that we know very little about how people function has a lot to do with the way we've been asking questions. I think if you ask questions outright, people often know what you want to hear and they give you dodgy answers. Um, and, and I also am skeptical of the rational voter model. So people join parties because they have interest and they align their interests with preferences. I, I, I th actually frankly think we don't know why a lot of people support parties. And I think people have very different motives. We did a survey in, in, in Britain, United States, and Austria because we figured out we could have filler questions between commercial surveys where we asked people about party and party membership. We found out that a lot of people join parties because they want to be among like-minded people. They want to talk to people that they like. They don't care whether these parties win elections. They just want to be, meet people who function like them. Other people simply like the party leader. And they, they, they have an emotional connection to the party leader, like Trump is a great example. They like Trump on an emotional level. They think he's cool. I like him. And then they find the rationale why they like him. So it's not like they have a rationale, they go through the list and say, okay, this is the person who most matches my preference, but somehow they connect, they latch onto him, and then they want to be given a reason for why they, why they like him. If you think of, um, what was his name uh, in Georgia? He was running for the Senate. He lost uh, um, Heisman Trophy winner, um, pardon, Herschel Walker, exactly. Herschel Walker. See, so why would anyone vote for Herschel Walker? I think if you know all these things, it seems, you know, given in illegitimate children and so on and so forth, 
But what you find is that people actually want to vote for him. They like that person, and all the wait is for you to give them a reason to actually like him. Sort of, you know, they're already sold, but then they're held back because they find some evidence that's kind of making them pause. And then you give them something that then closes the deal because they have a very different attitude. So when it comes to voting or supporting parties, we cannot discount these em emotional connections and uh, a, a completely different approach of why actually people go into politics. And, and in many ways, we, ha we understand um, too little about this, but we have actually a paper coming out on this, call it um, Magical Beasts or Mirror Me. A part is a mirror of me, a part is a fantastical beast that um, you find fascinating and therefore you, you're drawn to it in some ways. So I believe the, the, the classical rational model is probably, uh, is of limited uh, utility. Now the question on on, um, on clinical, um, or whether it is a clinical test. No, we cannot do clinical. Uh, we're not psychologists. So what we, we, what we can do is, and we, ha we have to do this in political science. When, I'm, I'm for example, as, as a researcher, I think we have too long in political science imposed our views on respondents, like democracy. We say, okay, do you believe in democracy? And we ask people yes or no. And then we assume the person that we interview about democracy has the same view as I, the researcher. So that's a very much a top-down approach. Now, I'm asking you, do you, have you felt sick as a result of COVID? Or do you feel you have control over your lives? Who am I to now question your answer? I have to let you interpret this in any way you want to interpret this. Maybe you interpret this way, you interpret it in that way. That's the right you have as someone I'm asking. I feel if I now said, okay, this answer you're giving may not be my answer, therefore it has less legitimacy. Because the person is also the person that in the end ends up voting. And something about that person's experience, whatever that person means, makes that person more likely to vote for party X and less likely to vote for party Y. It's my job to try to understand the connection, but I am not the person who can somehow um, divide them into different groups between more legitimate and less legitimate respondents. I have to accept that the respondent's objective answer is the best answer the respondents can give me, and that is what I have to work with. Thank you. And I think uh, maybe a hand up who still wants to ask questions. That is three. That makes another round of three. And maybe we're going to start with a gentleman in the middle. Yes. <coughs> Because it's for you with a microphone, by far the easiest person to reach. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Hans. I'm a student of retirement. And <laughs> I, I will take you from conspiracy theories to counterterrorism. What does it take to radicalize a conspiracy theorist into terrorism or other kinds of political violence? Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, Victor. <laughs> So, yeah. My name is Victor, thank you for your talk. So I have a question about, um, because you've talked about populism and also mainstream parties, for example. So my question is, at what point do we have, say, populist parties that eventually become mainstream parties? Thank you. And then one more. Um, good evening. I'm Anubhav, student of MICE as well from the DA. My question sort of jumps off the last response you gave, and uh, this is where I sort of draw attention to the fact that with the prevalence of dog whistling and the distortion of language that sort of pervades into, especially, I won't accuse any particular side of this, but into populist politics, and you mentioned that you're already skeptical about using surveys and self-assessment me metrics, how easy or difficult is it to get data that lets you actively decide whether or not someone is willing to act upon their belief systems or whether they think that they believe something or not? Because it's very easy for someone to say, oh no, I'm, act I'm not actually, uh, I don't actually believe in this political party, I just want a strong leader, or 
On the contrary, I will only say, hey, I'm actually a populist, but because I cannot actually do a Roman salute and get away with it in real life. Like, how does that affect the data collection and utility process as a social scientist for you? Thank you. Okay, uh, again, uh, great question. Let me take on the first the, kind of the, the terrorism question. I, I believe there is, um, I think that's where that is headed because I think when we talk about cults, we can easily think about both the radicalization of the uh, European left in the 1970s, of the RAF, the Red Brigades, um, the Action Directe, where you have young people convince themselves they're, they're facing a fascist, capitalist, totalitarian state, they have to fight. Um, uh, they have to fight through terrorism and convince themselves violence is the only option. And to, you have to go down that path. I think I can see the same in, in Islamic radicalization or Islamist radicalization and in other areas. I mean, um, um, and that could be also in, the, um, in Peru, in the, in the Altiplano, um, where people feel um, they, they're, they're shutting out every kind of um, countervening evidence and convince themselves into these things are not happening for a reason, and their response to the response is the the the, the, the radical violent um, fighting back. And I think that is a mechanism that is, on a psychological level, probably very similar because you, you're going down that tunnel and you cut yourself off from from the other evidence. Um, and 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 of course, the terrorism is not the same as conspiracy. You can be sitting at home and post. The, the big E-gate, battery gate, diesel gate conspiracy, but you're not, you don't gotta go out and, 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 and do violent things. So the, the call to action uh, and the activation to action is another level, and that, uh, I guess, um, is, is something that happens, is an additional process that separates the larger group from the smaller group. But there's clearly, in my view, um, um, there is a, 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 a I mean, very similar, and when people are deprogrammed, when they come out of a radical, of a cult, of a radical group, the deprogramming seems to rely very much on, on methods that are the reverse, and try to reverse sort of conspiratorial um, uh, accounts. Um, then um, um, going back to a sort of the um, populism and um, sorry, what was the, the what was your uh, that was another I uh, have your that was another question. Sorry, that we, yeah, sorry. Um, Mainstream parties. Well, it's a very good point, but it's a bit of a semantic issue. So mainstream, in, for lack of a better word, populist parties, we identify parties. If, if, a, if a party tells you they're good people and they're elites, and the elites are corrupt, there's nothing in between, you've got to choose, and we are the only party that understands, and all the other parties are, are traitors, and we cannot deal with them, we cannot compromise with them. Um, that party is a populist party. A party that is that, and, and populist parties are, are still democratic parties. So populist parties are not undemocratic parties because the populist party does not necessarily call for violence, and the populist party also believes in elections. So we have to distinguish populist parties or radical parties from extremist parties. Extremist parties call for 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 violence and under democratic, and then there are mainstream parties in the sense these are parties who are politically centrist. They see the other side as competitors, but not as their mortal enemies. They understand compromising is necessary in democracy, and they understand that the people are pluralist, people are diverse. Populist parties will claim that the people are the same, and you're either with the people or you're against the people. While a, a mainstream party will usually claim, well, people have different interests, people are very diverse, so we have um, a, a broader party spectrum, and therefore the parties need to compromise and form coalitions. So that's sort of, for lack of a, of a better word, using the, the word mainstream, it's not a super political science-y term. And, and um, um, your comment, um, um, in terms of, you, you're completely right. So I do look as a social scientist what informs political decisions. Voting is a political decision. Going to a protest is political decision. These are all political decisions. Um, po po political actors going out and doing things and um, propagating certain ideas, these are political actions. The reason why we look at propensity to vote and not, uh, or uh, party appeal but not voting is precisely for the reason that you that you actually the concern that you raise. Voting is a much more strategic uh, decision. We know that from the voting literature. I can be um, 
a fan of party X, but I can't vote for X because if I vote for X, then the party I hate, Z, gets elected. So I'd rather vote for party Y to prevent Z, although I'd much rather love to, to vote for party X. So the voting is, is more strategic, and therefore the, the, the way people end up voting is often only indirectly related to their attitudes. So therefore, party appeal, you ask people, okay, what party do you feel closest to? And they give them a choice of parties. That, we know that that seems to be the most authentic, authentic representation and lowers the bar the most to connect people with parties. If they ask them, which party did you vote for the last time, there could be lots of reasons why they voted for a party. Uh, they may have just hated the, the, the party leader at that time. But party appeal is the, the way we understand which is the party that speaks to them. And that is what we try to understand. Because we think, ultimately, if the time is right, the opportunity strikes, um, the people would be drawn to these parties. Sorry, does that okay? Yes, that was in the, in the way that thing. Rainer, thank you so much. Um, I really, I really learned a lot. Really enjoyed uh, listening to to your to your talk, to your answers, also to your questions. The questions uh, were actually very, very good. And uh, we have the opportunity now to continue this discussion in more informal ways over there next door. And uh, before we do that, please join me in a round of applause for Rainer. Thank you.